All right, well, we've been, uh, we've been in a, a series entitled Our Moment, and uh, we believe that this is the moment for us to step up into what God has called us to. We've talked the last few weeks about the importance for us to see the need, right? It's our moment to see the need. It's our moment to be the body. It's our moment to, uh, I'm sorry, it's our moment to uh, design a place to so see the need, design a place. It's our moment to carry a message, and it's our moment to break limitations. And so uh, I talk with you about how each of us have an opportunity to have moments with individuals, moments where you come into contact with somebody, and it's just throughout your day, and that moment is absolutely key. When we begin to miss the moments of the Holy Spirit stirring our heart and, and giving us an opportunity to talk to someone and interact with someone, man, that is a pivotal moment. You know, even today, right now, even within this building, within these four walls, there's moments that need to occur, not just with the Lord, but moments between you and others. You know, a lot of times we walk in and, and, we, and we walk in and we just assume everyone is just doing great, and yet when you walk in sometimes, man, people are carrying things, they're dealing with things. They're walking through things, situations that may have transpired just overnight. And it is critical for us to not miss the moments. A, a lot of times, you know, you know any, has anyone else just been like, wow, it's already, it's already March, right? Does anyone be like, what just happened? It's March, right? And, and you just all of a sudden, time moves pretty quickly, doesn't it? It moves quickly. And, and so if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in the moving that we miss moments that God designed for us to have with one another, with those within our community, those within our families. And so when we ask the Lord, Lord, give us the, give us the moments, right? Let us see the need around us. Lord, let us be ready with a message. Let us be ready to receive respond in those moments because this is the season to be ready. Let me tell you, this is the season to be ready. I feel like every time I think like we, we have transcended something, we, we've passed something, we've, we've got over something, you know, we're, we're good to go, you know, like we're, we're going to be okay. Something else in the world happens that reminds me of the need for each and every believer, each and every individual that knows the very hope of who Jesus Christ is that each person to be ready. I share with you some moments of, you know, guy, you know, ran into a guy at the gas station at five in the morning, right? And, and moments with others. I had moments with some of you last week just talking with you and you sharing your need. Let me tell you, these moments are critical. And today we're going to talk about just how important it is for us to understand this is our moment to be the body of Christ to be the body of Christ. And so uh, how many think, I, you know, sometimes doing a team sport feels like, you know what, I don't, I don't need these people, right? Do you ever try to do something and you get frustrated because you got some help, but the help isn't as great of help as you really want? And you go, you know what, why don't you all just go home and I'm going to just do it myself? Anyone ever feel like that? Everyone deal with that, right? Yeah, you know, you're just like, you know, hey, it's great to have a group here, but you know. And yet within the body of Christ, we all have strengths, right? We all have strengths, things that we're great at, things that we're not so great at, and the body needs one another. I love that there is, uh, how many basketball fans from like the 90s? Anybody remember like Michael Jordan heyday? Anybody? Okay. All right. So some of you watch some sports. I grew up in a sport family, right? My dad was a pastor. Here's what we did. We watched sports and we went to church. That was it, okay? Wasn't much else that we did, and then we played sports like crazy, right? I mean, and we didn't just play them. Like, we had to perfect the art of what they were. And so I grew up with uh, my brother being a Michael Jordan fan. I mean, he loved Michael Jordan. And so uh, Michael Jordan was the guy who won six championships and was like, like won three in a row. And if that means anything to you, it was pretty cool back in the day, uh, especially if you were a Chicago Bulls fan. Anybody... Was anyone a Chicago Bulls fan? Okay. The rest of us, the rest of us who weren't, we just knew when Michael Jordan and the Bulls got to the play, it was just over, right? I mean, the, the Knicks weren't going to beat them, you know what I mean? Reggie Miller wasn't going to beat them. Okay. If, I, if none of these names mean anything to you, it's okay. But Michael Jordan, right? You know, he's the greatest, you know. Uh, there was a guy that actually won more championships than Michael Jordan. Six is a lot, and three back-to-back -back was a lot. 
But there was a guy named Robert Horry. And this guy was like a great, he was a, he was a good athlete. He was no Michael Jordan. But he just so happened to be on three teams that won championships. He was on the Rockets, he was on the Spurs, and he was on the Lakers. And he being on the team, now he was a good player. Now you could put him in, he was going to make some things happen, but he was no Michael Jordan to carry the team. And yet he was on three teams and he won seven championships on those three teams. Now, we don't talk about you know, Robert Horry. We don't talk about this guy because he was an, a decent player. We talk about Michael Jordan as being the best. And yet, we see that something happened where, where a lot of times we think about these two things. There's two ways to be successful. One, we can personally, individually have success. And that's wonderful. There's nothing like when you individually do something and you accomplish something and you just can give yourself a pat on the back. I put the hard work in. I did it. And there's a lot of times you have to do individual things, right? But I love there's another way for us to be successful, and the other way is that we're a part of a team that's having success. And the thing I love about team success is that when you win with a team, you get to high-five someone else beside yourself. Because when you just win on your own, you go, you just kind of pat yourself on the back and you're like, man, that was a good job. And others may say, wow, you did a really good job. But when you're on a team and you win together, there's a lot of high fives that are happening. There's celebration that's happening. And I tell you that because it is crucial for you and I to be on a team as we serve Jesus Christ. And a lot of times we can get hurt, we can get, something can happen to us in the process, and we can say, you know what, I would rather this thing with Jesus just be, you know, just me and him. Now look, the relationship is between you and him, and when you stand before Jesus, he's going to judge you. When you stand before God, the Father, he's going to judge you according to what you have done. But Jesus didn't come to this earth and just say, hey, I got all the answers. I don't need you people. You know, just everyone do their own thing. He emphasized the importance of the body of Christ. And when Jesus went on to heaven, the early church came together and they became the body of Christ. And so sometimes, especially I've noticed that in the last two years, that we have gotten really good if you are not a people person, Right? And I'm not just saying just those that are not people first, you know what I mean? But if, if you like to just kind of do your own thing, this has been your season, right? This has been the season to shine because during COVID, man, you could isolate and you could hide out and you could say, I love Jesus from my bedroom, right? Watching church on my phone because, you know, I, you know, it's about one. Let me just tell you, right? Whether you're a people person or not, uh, I'm a people person, right? So that doesn't work for me. But, but some, I've, I've talked to some of you, and I love you so much, and you tell me, listen, I would just do life not interacting with anyone ever, and I would be okay with that. Anybody like that? All right, don't raise your hand. Okay. All right. But, but all of a sudden, right, we can think in terms of like, wow, this thing, this Christianity, you know, and, and, and then when stuff happens, have you, have you ever noticed that like when stuff happens, like when you get hurt? When like good people in church do bad things or unintentional things or make mistakes and it hurts you and you just think, well, if that's the church, I don't want to be a part of it. Let me just tell you, I'm just going to, I'm going to let you in on something as a father. I've been saved over 25 years. I gave my life to Jesus at 17, but I was in church my whole life prior to that. And let me just tell you, I hate to say this, but sometimes people are going to hurt you. I wish it was not that way. I wish everyone could be perfect and Christ-like in every single moment. But sometimes people do things, and I think sometimes we're even doing the right things, and it can hurt. And church hurt can happen. Can I tell you, in those moments, don't step away from the body, but lean in. Don't step away and say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to isolate, but lean in. Let healing occur. I love that Jesus called us not to just find the ones that look just like us and do life just with those that look just like us. But he says, I have called you to those that even are going to hurt you. Now, how, why in the world would Jesus do that? Would you remember that there was a guy in Jesus' inner circle that hurt him? 
And he even chose him. It was one of his friends, right? And you just think, what? And yet, we're called, Jesus said, listen, we're called to be a part of the body. And so when you think about Christianity, Christianity, as much as following Jesus is an individual thing, it's also a team sport. It's a team sport. We need one another. When we come together, right, when, you, when we come together, I mean, I love, I was just this last week, I was away with uh, some pastors, and we were in Houston, and, and we were at this big celebration, and it was just refreshing. I, I was just, I love just talking with pastors, and connecting with them, and sharing with them, and man, I was talking with another pastor, he was sharing with some struggles, some things are happening in his family, and he and I were just talking about kids, and just believing God for things in our lives, and, and, and just the camaraderie about what was happening. And I was just so thankful. Lord, thank you that I get moments like this. Let me tell you, the body is designed for us to have moments with one another, right? So that we can strengthen one another. But it's easy for us to to go through something and say, you know what? I I, I just want to do this alone. And that many times can be a trap. Because we isolate, and in those moments, doing it alone becomes the worst thing that we can do. In those moments, we can actually, because I don't know if you've ever, I know you guys don't do this, it's probably just me, but I have conversations with myself. Does any of you have conversations with yourself? You may think that's like crazy, but I remember growing up, my dad, uh, we'd be driving to church, we'd be driving somewhere, and I would watch my dad, and I think I've picked up this bad habit. My kids have not called me out. My daughter hasn't called me out on this yet, but we would be driving in the car. My dad would be driving. I would be in the seat behind him in the back seat, and he would be just going, and he was having a conversation about something, and I would say, and then after a while, I was like, dad, who are you talking to? He's like, what, what, huh? I'm not talking to anybody. I'm like, Dad, who are you having a conversation with? And he's like, nothing. But what he was doing was probably what you and I do. Hey, we said, maybe we don't put some motions to it and verbal, you know, he wasn't saying anything, but he was, he was saying something. A lot of times when we isolate, we have conversations in our minds about, I can't believe that person did that. I can't believe they went there. I can't believe they did that. And, and all of a sudden, we begin to have this conversation that never really exists. And, and let me tell you, those moments where we isolate and we just give ourselves into our own thoughts and our own ways, and we don't surround ourselves with the body, we become unhealthy. I promise you that if you let isolation happen too long, you become unhealthy. And you think, no, no, you don't understand. But, but I'm interacting with good things. I'm, I'm viewing good things. I'm, you know, there's moments for us to get alone with God, but God designed us to be the body. And I'm so thankful for that because as the body, we're stronger. So there are moments in our life that this is the moment for us to see and understand that we are called to be the body. And so the body, this is a gathering point for the body. But I love that when I go through something, when I'm, when I'm walking through a season and it's a difficult moment that I can reach out to the body and say, would you pray with me? Would you believe with me? Would, would, you, would you just hold my hands up? Would you help me in this moment? And I love that. I'm so thankful that, you know, when we do stand before the Lord, we will give, uh, uh, we will give a report of everything we've done, right? But while we're here on earth, it is absolutely crucial that we have these interactions moments, these times where we come together. And, and even we see within Revelation, the last book of the Bible, we see here that Jesus appears in, in, in his resurrection form, and John, who is, who is one of his disciples, he gives them the message, the seven messages to the seven churches, and he speaks it to him, right? And, and it's, it's in these moments that God, that Jesus is saying, I've got a message to the church body, It wasn't just an individual affair. It just wasn't, he didn't just call out just certain people, but this was the body. And so we have to understand that that Jesus is even has something for the body, not just an individual thing. And I love that even when you wonder, I don't know if you ever wonder, like if Jesus was here today, if these seven letters to the seven churches were written, what would Jesus say to us if he had a message for us today? You see, in this series, we're talking about it's our moment. And this is our moment to be uh, on assignment. 
And, and, and here's the thing. Let me just help you if, you're, if you have not kind of journeyed with us for the last, you know, few months. But, but typically, my, uh, my wife and I, Leslie, which she's, she's hiding out somewhere. She's somewhere now. She's got her baby. Uh, but Leslie and I have these moments. And uh, we, in August, will have been pastors here for 10 years. And we have learned as we kind of enter into certain seasons that her and I kind of get alone. Uh, it's usually late after the kids are like in bed and, and uh, her and I will have those conversations, those deep conversations, right? Those conversations where it's just that quality time and, and, and we're talking about things. And, and, we're, and when we started out this year, we started talking. We said, you know, what do you think God, what do you think he has for us this year? What do you think God wants to do this year? I mean, we have absolutely no clue what's going to happen this year. The last two years are just like, you know, the playbook goes out the window of anything you had planned. And yet, what do you think God has in store for us this year? And so we began to talk and, and just share and, and her heart, she said, you know what, I want to believe God, that God would give us the opportunity to connect with a hundred souls, a hundred individuals. And I began to pray through that. And I began to say, God, what are we, God, what are you calling us to? And, and I just felt the Lord even say, you know what, beyond just a hundred souls, we need to go even a little bit deeper to a hundred disciples. And so we've been on this journey and it's great. You know, the awesome thing is when you let the Lord speak to you, he'll speak to you and he will line all these things up. And what we didn't know is we had, I had this series that I was already going to teach on in January on discipleship. And yet we, we heard the Lord really speak to us that that was kind of the focus. And then we went into, to this, into this series and we're talking through this series about our moments. And let me just tell you, God has a moment for you this year. And let me just say, don't miss the moments he has for you. 2022 is not a mistake year. 2022 is not what another year should have been. 2022 is, you know, it's nothing other than God has a moment, something he wants to do in your life this year. He wants to use you in such a powerful way. Let me take that a step further. He wants to use the body. He wants to use each of us to reach those around us. And if we only buy into the fact that he wants to just use me, we're going to miss out on what he wants to do in and through each of us. It's important for us to understand that God has moments for us individually, but God has a moment for us as a body. The assignment wasn't just given to one, it was given to us. Not just to you and me, but to us. And I love that. I love when I get to celebrate with someone. Let me tell you, if God does something in your life, share it with me. I want to celebrate with you. I, I, I love getting to celebrate with people, and we should become a, a body of those that love to celebrate. You know, I grew up in a church that, that, you know, back in the day, you didn't celebrate anything, right? Because I don't know, I guess it was like wrong. I don't know. But we didn't celebrate anything, right? I mean, it was just like, we just kind of went, we just did our thing, right? Let me tell you, celebrating what God does is so crucial and so, and so important. Let me tell you, when God does something in one of us, right, we all should celebrate in that victory. When God brings someone to your family member to church, man, we should all celebrate in that moment. So today we're going to focus on what does it mean to be the body. And Paul says, and I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and hopefully you got some notes today so you can fill in the blank and kind of help you kind of move through this message. But I love it. Paul here, he's writing, and in the New Testament, Paul wrote a lot of the books or letters to churches and he's writing to a, a specific local church. And we're going to talk through one of the letters that he wrote to the church in Corinth. Right? So this would have been a really thriving church. This would have been like a church in New York City. A church where there was a lot going on. There was, there was a lot going on in just the economy there. Things were good. Right? This would have been a, a, a church that was even thriving and, and great things were happening. And, and there's this overarching theme of what we're going to read today. Uh, and, and since Christianity is this team sport, right? Christianity is this thing that's designed to do with others others, right, to d design to partner with others, and that is that I can't truly follow Christ, this is when you fill in the blanks, I can't truly follow Christ without you. 
Now, I have to have a personal relationship, but God designed you and I for us to follow along together in this journey. And that means when we go through 2022 and 2023 and every year after that until Jesus comes, it's designed for us to do it together. It's designed for us to to come together in such a way that we partner together. That means that I need you, you need me, and in order for us to do well, we need each other. Don't let that message get lost, no matter what happens in culture, no matter what happens in in society. I love when you read about uh, countries that close. You know, you think about China, became like a closed country, and all of a sudden, there there was Christians going in, and I'm going to get the statistics wrong, but it was something like, you know, there was there was a handful. There was there was X amount of Christians, and and communism came in and sh- pretty much closed the country off. And then finally, when things began to lift, all of a sudden they found that the church grew in those moments, not by individuals doing their own thing, but by the church, by the body coming together and doing life together, doing ministry together. And all of a sudden, through the very struggle, all of a sudden something happened in their midst. The body began to function. No matter what the enemy has in store, if we will stay together as a body, we will accomplish what God has called us to do. And I love when I think about what God has called us to. I don't know what God's called you to, but when you understand what God has called us to, and and look, I'm just going to just get on one of my soapboxes here just for a second, but I think these are the things I think about. I think about Ashton City. Whether you grew up here or you just moved here or you don't even know what Ashton... I mean, we're in Ashton City. We're in the county of Cheatham County. And as a pastor here, I don't want to just do good things and have good services. And, and I, I, But my heart is, God, would we make such an impact? There's an eternal impact that we make. Can, can we shift some of the things that, that this community is just dying from, right? Uh, can we help make not a difference just by being good people, but can we make an eternal difference by connecting with those within our community, ministering to them, bringing hope to them, sharing who you are so that life change can happen? And so that requires moments that we have with individuals within our community, within our family. Listen, God has called us to our families. Let me tell you, God has called us to our, I love what Will was, as Will was singing today, and he just, he brought out the family focus, right? He, he, he focused it, and I just thought, I was thinking of some family members that I absolutely want Jesus to get a hold of their lives, that I pray for and believing for. Let me tell you, it's our moment to declare over our families the goodness of who God God is and what God wants to do in their lives. So here we see this letter that Paul wrote in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and he, and he wrote it to the church in Corinth, and he tells them a few particular things. And so look with me in 1st Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. We're going to look at verse 17, and we're going to move on from there. It says, but in the following instructions, I can't praise you. For it sounds as if uh, more harm than good is done when you meet together. So Paul is writing to a church in in a great area. The church is doing well. And Paul is coming at, he's writing to this great church that looks great on the outside. And he's challenging the church. And he says, I can't praise you, right? And he says, it sounds like if, it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. And then he says, first, I hear that there is division among you when you meet as a church, when you meet as a body. And some, and to some extent, I believe it. So Paul, who planted the church as he's, as he's going through and reaching those, all of a sudden he says in this moment, he said, I, man, you got a great church. Looks great on the outside. But when you come together, division occurs, things are happening. The body is not functioning as it is intended to. Have you ever been a part of a church where you come in and everybody's got their little things, right? Everybody's got their little groups. Everybody's doing their little things. And, And even though you're all within the same building or all within the same space, all of a sudden there's not the unity, And Paul is writing and he's saying, listen, I love you dearly. I have my heart is for you. But let me just caution you that when you come together, sounds like 
It's more damaged. It's, 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 it's not as healthy as it needs to be. And at the beginning of the letter, he talks about how these different groups or tribes were happening within the congregation based upon who different people like to hear, right? And so some would say, you know, uh, some would say, I, you know, I, 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 my guy is Paul. And some would say, my guy is Apollos. And some would say, my guy is, you know, Simon Peter. And some would say, well, you know, my guy is just Jesus. You know, he's not here, but that's my guy, you know. And, and Paul was intentionally focusing on that a group of people had come together. The early church had happened. This was in a great area, great church, great things could, could be said about what it looked like, except within the body, there was division within itself. And when division occurs, the body cannot function the way it's designed to. When we get sick, right, when something happens within our body, and it's, it's I, I look at it as like when our physical body gets sick or something, you, you know, someone gets cancer, right? There's the vision happening in that body, right? That body is not in one accord functioning the way it needs to. There's something that has attacked the very system and has, has sought to destroy the very system within that body. And that was never what God intended for the physical body, never intended for the spiritual body, for the church as a whole. And so Paul is challenging each of the believers in this church. And he's challenging and he's saying, listen, watch the division that's among you. You know, a lot of times uh, we can get caught up in, in, in just not even, not even realizing some things. And it's a great, I love when I read James. James is like, it's like, you know, smack across the face to me when I read, like in a good way, right? I mean, it's like, a, hey, get it together, right? And James tells us, you better watch what you say. You better watch, you know, my brother gave himself for you so that you could have an eternal life. My brother gave it all for you. Watch what you say and watch how you act. Don't just say you read the word and not apply it, but apply it to your life. And James was saying, listen, it's time for you to, to, to not just say you're a Christian, but walk it. And can I say, part of walking the walk as a believer of Jesus Christ is the unity that happens within the body. Now, let me first say, I want to just make sure you understand something. I'm thankful that when I look at our, our body, when I look at our church, I don't see disunity. But I know that the enemy of unity is disunity. And that if we're not careful, whether it's in our lives, within our, within our church family, that is the very area that the enemy wants to disrupt. When we work as one body and when we're in step as one body, the unity factor makes it absolutely, I mean, I mean, unity is talked about within the word of God. It says, listen, when as one body you do something, man, the very gates of hell, right? I mean, there's so much that can be accomplished in unity. And I love that, that, that Jesus even spells this out and walks this out. But in the beginning, Paul is addressing the Corinth church, and, and I want to give you this point, that you are given, right? And, and this is one of, like, kind of the, one of the kind of challenges or rebukes even Paul is coming at this church with. He says, you're given into divisiveness instead of living in love, right? And so the challenge is, is that in our lives, this is our moment to be the body, so we should guard what the body is. Let's not be divisive. Listen, if any, anytime you want to say something about another, guard your mouth, right? Man, this mouth can get a lot of us in trouble, right? In fact, all of us in trouble, this mouth can bring so seeds of division and destruction. And if we're not careful, this mouth can, can actually cause some long-term effects to happen. And Paul is writing to a great church and that, that looks like he's doing great things. And he's saying, listen, don't give in to the division. Don't give in to the divisiveness. But instead, live in love. Do you know what love is? Love is not the thing that happens on Valentine's Day. In fact, love is a very difficult thing to do. Because who do we love? We love our family, or most of them, right? There's always a few we're like, eh, we put up with them, right? <laughs> but we love our family, we love our friends. 
But do you realize the fruit of the Spirit is love? The evidence of the Spirit of God inside of us is love. The evidence that produces something is not just the love that you and I get like, oh, we feel like we love this little puppy, right? Or we love this newborn baby. But it's a supernatural love that, that goes beyond what we can naturally do when it says to love your neighbor as yourself, to love your enemy, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, the word enemy and love don't seem to go together well, right? Because if they're your enemy, then they're probably not your friend. And that means you got to love people that aren't your friend. Have you ever interacted with one of those people? Have you ever worked with one of those people? Don't raise your hand. I'm just, just saying, right? There may be someone, and yet the Holy Spirit says, listen, the evidence that, that the Spirit of God is inside of you is that love begins to move in and through you. This particular message that we're studying, 1 Corinthians, in this very intentional season that we're in, Paul is teaching us how to celebrate communion. And in fact, here at the end of our service, we're going to have a time of communion Because communion is celebrating the body of Christ. Communion is literally celebrating what Jesus did in our lives, right? And and when we do communion, uh, we're going to look at this just a little bit deeper, but when we do communion, communion is not just uh, us saying, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done, but it's also examining the body as in those around us. How is the body doing? You know, sometimes I walk into church and I feel good, but I just have this heaviness. And I, as I interact with, with some of you, I realize there are things that are going on in your life that you need Jesus to move in your life. That if God doesn't do something, you know, maybe you got a, just a, something happened. Maybe you got a bad report of something happened in your family. Or maybe, maybe something happened on the way to church or maybe something happened this week. Or maybe it's just, and all of a sudden you're carrying that with you. And the body was designed that as we come together, that we carry each other's burdens, that we minister to one another, that we say, listen, let's pray together. Let's believe God that he will have the, that the answer will come about, that healing will occur, that restoration would occur. When we keep moving on from that, we say, you know what? I don't need the body. We miss out on what God wants to do within us. Because here's what I found is that sometimes the prickly people in our lives that God puts in our lives, do you ever like pray someone away? Like, Jesus, help that person move away. Help that person get transferred to another place. You know what I mean? Like you're going to Jesus and you're like, you know, just however you need to take them, right? I mean, just move them on. I mean, I've had seasons like that, right? So Jesus, you know, just take them. You know what I mean? However you need to move them, move them. But I've also heard the Holy Spirit say, but, but that little prickly person is causing a few things to come to the surface in your life. Now, those are conversations I don't like having, you know. And the Lord says, I want to draw some things out of you because I've called you, each of us, to those that don't look like us, don't act like us. And when we come together, even though there's differences within the body, Jesus said, Paul wrote, listen, let love occur within those moments. You know what I love about a a church body is that we all can have different political views. We can have differences on the way culture should be formed and shaped. We can have differences in many areas of our lives. Hopefully we come together on the one thing that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I believe that's where we come together. But the diversity among us, right? We look different. We act different. We have different ages, right? Uh, All those things are healthy things for us to be around because diversity, it can strengthen us if we'll let it. And so I love the challenges that, that, that the church, the challenge was that the division was coming. But Paul said, instead of letting that happen, instead let love occur in your life. And I love that, uh, that in this season that we can walk out and we can say, okay, Lord, let, if, when it comes, Lord, if it comes, however it looks, whatever it looks like. Listen, if you hear somebody saying something that's divisive, you say, you know what? We're not going to talk about that. Or help stop division, right? And help foster love, right? Sometimes people will tell me, well, I don't like this person because of this. And I'll tell you, well, yeah, that's, uh, 
you know, in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that's, that's a weakness. Of theirs. But I'll say, you know what? Isn't that a personal blessing? And I'll try to focus on their strengths. Because what I have found is that, I think we all have found this, that each of us has strengths and weaknesses. And, and it's easy to see them, right? If, you, if you're strong where someone else is weak, it's easy to see the weakness. And yet, let's focus on the strengths. Let's focus on loving one another. But I want us to continue in verse 19. And, and Paul continues, and he, he says, But of course, there must be division or differences among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. Let me help you here for a second. Uh, I don't know sometimes when you read the Bible, if you believe in sarcasm, but sarcasm happens in the Bible. Paul is saying, he says, and read this sarcastically, but of course there must be division among you. But of course there must be differences among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. You, can you hear it? Of course you need to be different and of course you need to, to look, of course there has to be differences so that you can have God's approval or recognition. And then he says, when, I, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper. When you come together, you, you, you almost boast in the fact that, you know, oh, we have to be divided. We have to be different. And, 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 and sarcastically, Paul is saying, you think like somehow that attracts God and it doesn't in any way. And then he says, when you meet together, you're not really interested in the Lord's Supper, remembering what he did. For some of you, hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. So let me just pause here just for a moment. And let me help you just for a moment. One of the things that the early church did seems to be a theme within church, is they like to eat. Glory to God, right? <laughs> they like to do some potlucks together, right? They would gather and they would celebrate who Jesus was because Jesus said, right, do this in remembrance of me. The early church did it in remembrance of him. Paul is saying, listen, sometimes you get together and you're really not interested in remembering who Jesus was celebrating the Lord's Supper. But what you're more interested in is just getting together with those that look like you and do your thing. Paul is saying, come on, there, there's something more important than, than, than just, uh, just being right and being with, with the right people and, and, and the people that look like you. And he says, uh, it, it is that you learn how to live right and act like Jesus in righteous ways. It's important that you understand. So they would come together. So here's what would happen. They would have potlucks, right? They would have moments where they would, you know, come together in fellowship. And do you ever realize... So sometimes when we have like a little food gathering, one of the things I like to do is I like to just go to a different table and sit with people I don't normally get to see on Sunday because it's important to not just go to those that you just know, right? It's important for you to interact with those that you've never met. Here today, this morning, if there are people in the building you don't know, afterwards go up to them and say, hey, I don't know you. How are you doing? I, I love that uh, that, that happened actually uh, uh, maybe a year ago. Richard and Mary, who have been part of our church for a thousand years, right? No, just like maybe 15, 20 years, okay? Uh, they, had, they had not been here for a little bit, and, our, and they, uh, Paul came up to them one Sunday. It was at one of the Sundays they came, and, and Paul came up and said, hey, it's nice to meet you. Thanks for being here today. So glad you could be here. And, you know, Richard and Mary used to be the greeters at the front door when I came to the church, and they were like, well, nice to meet you too. Like this is, you know, and they were impressed that, that somebody they didn't know was greeting them, right? But is, that's one of the great things about the body. And yet here Paul is saying, sometimes you gather and you just get in your little areas and you're not even there to celebrate the very reason you're there to celebrate. I hope when we come together and to, ch to come together for church, it's not just to see our, our person that we hadn't seen all week, but we come together to celebrate who Jesus is, to celebrate what he did in our life, to celebrate what he rescued us from, to celebrate that he died on the cross. That was a real thing, that without that, we would not have an eternity in heaven, to celebrate the hope that he brought into our lives, to celebrate and then meet new people. Listen, meeting new people may feel like a, a thing that doesn't feel comfortable. It's the greatest thing that we can do. Get to know people around you because this body is who he's called us to. I love that when we understand that, that Jesus is saying, listen, I don't want you to be a part of a body just for all certain kind of people to be over here and those over there. The body to function together and flow together. Let me give you the second idea that you're doing church 
This was a challenge. This was something that, that Paul was even challenging this church, almost really rebuking it in a way. And he says, you're doing church unto yourself for yourself. And remember, we're looking for moments to be the body. Looking for moments to be the body of Christ. Which means it's not an isolated thing. But that means that when we come together, we don't come together for ourselves to do church unto ourselves, but we come together to be together and to be in one accord and to celebrate together. And, and not, just, not just to do it unto ourselves or to think about it, but I, you know, there's a tendency in, the, in our culture today, right? That everything's about us. Everything's about us. But there, everything is, is just us focused. And so when we understand that the Lord is calling us to something deeper than that, and calling us to change even the, the lens or which we look through the, this particular experience, we say, God, Lord, it is so crucial for us to not do life about us, but to do life for others and with others. I love how Paul just, he puts this, this emphasis there and he says, listen, there's this tendency to, to even just focus on, uh, on really what church can even do. So do you ever like go to church and you say, you know what, uh, how do you think the service went? And you're like, eh, it's all right, you know, Pastor Jonathan, you yeah, did okay. Pastor Chris, you did okay. You know, you kind of evaluate it like you go to a restaurant. You know, like when you go to a restaurant, like you have the, re- like when I go to a restaurant, I look it up and I look for the reviews. And if it has good reviews, then I go check it out. And then afterwards, you know, Liz and I are driving in the car and we kind of do an evaluation. Was that burger the best one in Nashville? Went to this burger place and they're like, burger of the month. This is the craziest thing I've ever ate. Had peanut butter on it. And there's this curiosity part of me. It's awful, awful part of me. I've got to try new things. So I was just, I looked at the lady and I'm like, this cannot be on, on your menu if it's absolutely awful. And she says, some people, it's called like an Alabama burger or something. Some people, which I don't know what that means, but. Sorry, my mic died. Some people really like it. And I'm like, huh, all right, let me try that thing. Let me, let me, let me try that, that uh, peanut butter burger, right? So when we left, you know, then what do we do? We kind of evaluated it, right? We kind of were like, you know, Leslie's like, was that peanut butter burger really that good? And I was like, eh, I don't think I would get it again. Because not only did it have peanut butter, it had blue cheese. <laughs> if any of you want to know the name of the restaurant, <laughs> I'll let you in. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes when we come to church, sometimes we can evaluate church like we do a restaurant, Right? We can say, oh, was, you know, was that good? Was that good? Listen, it is absolutely crucial that when we come together, we come into the same place that, that we're not doing church for what the menu can do for us, right? It, it, it's, it's, but we come to church and we say, God, I want to encounter you. I want to experience ministry with those around me. I want to come. And, and I, you know, it's interesting. Sometimes people go, you know, I wasn't just feeling it today. And sometimes you're not feeling it. But doesn't mean that God isn't here and that God isn't moving. Because some, one person will say, that was the greatest service. Worship was amazing. Right? And maybe somebody else will say, well, you know, that was just, you know, I don't know. I wasn't feeling it. Let me tell you, when you come Come together. When you come into uh, the gathering of the body, don't do church unto yourself for yourself, but come and be a part of the body and celebrate what God is doing. Let me tell you, each week God is ministering to someone. If you don't get anything, pray and say, Jesus, I want to encounter you. You know what I do in worship when I'm up here? When I'm, I'm getting ready to preach, you know what I'm doing during worship? This is the thing I say, God, break me of me. Because you can't be broken in the presence of God and not get something from him. It doesn't matter how good or bad the preaching or the worship is. You can't be broken in the presence of God without sensing him and see what he's doing. So when we come into the body, we say, listen, God, you know what? I I, I don't want to just do this unto me. I want to do this. I want to do this for the body. I want to do this unto you. God, how can I minister to those around me? 
1 Corinthians 11 continues, as a result, some of you go hungry while others of you get, get, get drunk. What? Do you, do you have your own homes for eating and drinking? So he kind of just emphasizes again just this kind of isolation as this gathering of, of eating and fellowship happens. Some of you just kind of do your thing. And, and I love that. This is, this is what I want you to catch. The church life develops more from what you put in than what you get out of it. Let me, let me help you out with this. So I grew up in a pastor's home. I didn't have a choice in where we went to church. Like you went to your dad's church, you know what I mean? And then when I was 18, I moved to Florida. I went to a school and they had a church and I went there. And then when I moved to Nashville, for the very first time, I got to experience that thing called church hopping, which is a wonderful game, right? You get to go experience different people, different churches, different preaching, right? And I remember I like went to a really, really big church. Like if I said the name of y'all, we go, oh yeah, I know the church. And then I went to like a small church. I did help do a church plant. And then I went to another church plant, right? And you know, I, and, and then, we, then we moved to, to East Tennessee. And uh, life's done a little different out there, okay? And, and we were in the great metropolis of Oak Ridge, the hidden city. And, and I remember in each of those things, let me just tell you, whether I went to a big church or a small church, where I got fed the most is where I engaged in the church. So I couldn't just say, like, I went to one big church and I got nothing out of it. I wasn't stretched. The preaching was good. The worship was great. But I wasn't stretched. I didn't grow in that. I went to another big church while I was in Florida, and that's where I served. And when I served, all of a sudden something happened. I grew. And Because here's the thing that happens is when you let God do something, you give him some opportunities when you serve and when you give. When that happens, you're letting yourself be stretched. And so when I went to the church plant, I was getting really stretched because I was slash. I was like associate, you know, associate pastor slash the sound guy slash the guy who set up the chairs slash the guy who took down the chairs slash, you know, the guy who like, you know what I mean? Like I was slash, right? And so I just kind of did a little bit of everything. Let me tell you, if you want to get the most out of the body of Christ, serve. Now that sounds like a great selfish thing for a pastor to say because he's like, oh, we need more volunteers, right? That's kind of the, the anthem. But let me tell you, when you serve, you give the Lord an opportunity to move inside of you and move in your life. When you are ministering to our kids in, in, in kids' church or nursery or when you're part of a small group, all of a sudden you get stretched because questions are being asked. You're having to study. You're having to go deeper. And in those moments, something happens in your life. Something occurs in your life. And let me tell you, God is saying, I want you to be a part of the body. I don't want you just to be a bystander. I want you to grow inside. I want you to grow and develop. And so here, this is one of the greatest things that we can do is that in our walk, let our walk develop by getting plugged in. First Corinthians continues, and, in, and Paul says in the last part of First Corinthians eleven twenty two, it says, "Or do you really want to disgrace God, uh, dis disgrace God's church, and shame the poor?" What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you. One of the things. Paul was focusing on it. Here's, here's your third point. I'm going to give, your, give these to you real quick. But the third thing is that we're called to be the body. But here's the thing. If we ignore the poor and the hurting in our midst, we are not able to be the body. One of the things that, that we need to be attentive to is within the body, those that are in need. Those that are in need, right? We want to meet the needs of those outside of the body, but within the body. See, what was happening is there was this division within, and it was focused on even classes of individuals and their, their financial situations. And, and Paul was saying, listen, do you want me to praise the very fact that, yes, there's a great church that looks great, and you're in a great community that's growing and thriving, but within, there's division. You come for yourself, and you're not, well, you're not ministering to the very body that's there. Let me just tell you, I believe, I'm so thankful that, that our church ministers within, right? When there's a need, we minister within, and that's a great thing. It's something we need to guard at all times and say, God, you've called us in this moment to be the body. And let me give you this, this fourth one here, and this is crucial. 
is that you understand the vertical, right? You and God, right? Implications of, of the new covenant, right? Of what the new covenant means between you and God. But you forgot about that horizontal. The covenant between those around you, who God has called you to and what God has called you to do. And, and I see this word covenant, what is it? We understand the marriage covenant, don't we? Like when two people get married, they come together in agreement, and it, it's a lasting, it's a commitment, right? And, and it's something that, you know, it's till death do us part. And, and in that, there's a covenant between us and God. There's a covenant that occurs between us and God. And let me tell you, that covenant isn't just with God, but it's actually to the body itself. That we're to come into covenant with the body, and say, you know what, I, I, I love that when, when Jesus did something in me, he didn't say, okay, you go do your own thing and survive on your own. But come into the body and, and guess what? Make a commitment to the body. Make a commitment to those around you. Say, hey, listen, in 2022, we're going to make it. We're not going to just survive it. We're going to thrive. No matter what situations come our way, we're going to come together because we don't want to just have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Thank you, Lord, this morning for who you are. And I thank you, Lord, for this body of believers. Lord, may this body grow and flourish. Lord, may we walk in unison. Father, may, Father, we understand the season you're calling us to, the moment you're calling us to. Father, may we see great victory, Lord, of those that are hurt, those that are broken, those that are away from you coming back to you, Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord, and we ask all these things in your precious name. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen, 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 amen. Listen, I love you. Listen, it's Wednesday, come Wednesday nights, right here at 6.30 in the building. And join us next Sunday. Next Sunday, we've got a missionary that will be with us. It's going to be a great Sunday. Make sure you interact today before you go with the body. God bless.